Um, so thanks very much, uh, Shabazz, and everybody for uh, being here today. I think this is a really important topic, and I'm really thankful that um, the Centre is giving us an opportunity to be able to talk about this. Um, so what I'll do here is I have a presentation, and I'm just going to share my screen. I will have to do a bit of back and forth. Um, I was just mentioning earlier that um, I am traveling at the moment, so I don't have, you know, different screens. I'm on a very small laptop, so I will be also working through my, um, sorry, just wondering if I can also find a way to see my notes here, or if I have to, uh, I know sharing my screen is not very helpful when, when I'm trying to see my notes. So what I'm going to do actually is just, um, how can I go through this? Well, thank you. So I apologize for a few technical details here. I'll bring up uh, my presentation on my phone so I can read it um, and share my screen just when I have a moment. But my first slide is not important that you need to see. What I do want to say, though, before I begin, I want to foreground the issue of my centering white Canadian voices and experiences in response to the brutalization and murder of Black Americans at the hands of police and other state officials. The title of my presentation identifies BLM 2020, which situates the murder of Mr. George Floyd in Minneapolis. So Mr. Floyd was a, a father, a brother, and a son who was born in North Carolina and who moved to Texas and finally Minneapolis. And he played basketball and football in high school and college. He survived his encounters with the prison industrial complex. And in 2013, um, he became a mentor in, the religious, in his religious community and posted anti-violence videos on social media. So Mr. Floyd has worked as a truck driver and a bouncer and was one of many racialized individuals who disproportionately lost their jobs during the pandemic. As a human being who died at the hands of state officials in a system of white supremacy, I do not want to trivialize or lose sight of the human being at the center of this controversy. I also don't want to lose sight of the pattern of aggravated assaults and murder of American men and women at the hands of police, the state in the US and Canada, as I discuss and theorize white reactions to this tragic event. As one of a number of white or white presenting and therefore racially privileged academics who are researching and writing on the topic of Black Lives Matter, I want and need to question how I am and will be benefiting from this work socially, economically, and politically. Mr. Floyd and all racialized humans who lost their lives due to state-sponsored violence deserve to see change in our systems. And I want to recognize that presenting a paper in this venue, while important, will not likely realize meaningful change on the everyday level in Edmonton Treaty 6 territory in Canada, where I work and live. Participating in this virtual conference is one of a number of actions and work that I am currently involved in. And the goal of presenting on this work here today is one of a few steps I'm taking to meaningfully engage in anti-racism work. I'm happy to delve deeper into this topic in the Q&A. So I begin with these points as they situate my identity and knowledge in this work. As a sociocultural anthropologist investigating whiteness and white racial identity, I am trying to integrate what Corses Zimmerman and critical, uh, what Corses Zimmerman and Guida call um, critical whiteness methodologies. And so I'm just going to take a moment here and bring this, finally bring my slides up. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so sorry, I'm just, I'm laughing for just a moment because it seems as though I have not saved my speech <laughs> uh, so that it can be available on my phone. Oh, okay. I know what's happened here. So here we go. So let me just take a moment here to uh, share my screen. I swear I am somewhat technically savvy. I'm just working with something I'm, uh, I'm a little unfamiliar with my setup today. So. Um, I just wanted to make that positioning statement. Okay. And so um, this is the, what courses Zimmerman and Guida call critical whiteness methodologies. And you can see it described here on the slide. So my goal is to engage and act meaningfully and as an academic and human seeking anti-racist outcomes by committing to a critical whiteness research practice that creates a space for challenging oppressive system and ideologies. Um, with that preface, I would like to move into the work of the field in North, Amer uh, North American anthropology, just to situate myself and acknowledging that we're not all anthropologists here. 
Um, and again, just like some of the previous uh, slides, I won't be reading out everything that I have on the slides. Um, I, I encourage you to engage in it as, as you see fit. So in a relatively recent special issue on the anthropology of white supremacy, uh, Belisio de, de uh, Jesus and Pierre argued that scholars cannot simply focus on race, not the process of racialization or racism alone. And instead anthropologists were also called to, um, on attend, to attend to the specific power dynamics inherent in the construction of race, and more specifically on the hierarchical categorizations of white racial identity as it, constructs, uh, as it is constructed as being racially superior. As an unmarked identity, white racial identity is both an important and difficult cultural phenomenon to explore ethnographically, particularly in, Can in the Canadian context, which features multiculturalism and diversity as a core national ideology. Canada's recent racial reckoning has featured the discovery that is mainly a discussion of ignorance and surprise among white Canadians, of mass graves of First Nations children's bodies at defunct residential school sites, which has complicated and muddied white Canadians self identification as benevolent settlers. Instead, and following American anthropologist Hardigan Jr., I agree that whiteness lies at the heart of racial matters, and that it is context dependent. So you can see my definition of whiteness here on the slide, and I understand that whiteness reflects a system of policies and practices that are codified in law and maintained by society, which conceptualizes white ways of being and thinking to be superior and more deserving. I understand that one role of whiteness is to craft the context and ecosystem which allows racism to continue. Now, my larger project explores whiteness and white racial identity among white and Bentonians, and for this project, I'm conducting ethnography, for which, uh, which includes participant observation, in-depth interviews, focus groups, and pile sorting techniques. I've been collecting data since 2019 and have, sorry, and have collected 68 interviews to date, one just the day before I traveled to Escomalt, BC, which is the traditional territory of the Kosapsum people, which I am currently located. So in this work, I have witnessed the growing discontent and highly fraught on highly fraught topics such as identity politics, which you've heard about earlier today, freedom of speech, and what is thought of as the encroaching alt left agenda. So in what follows, I seek to answer the following questions today. How did my white participants respond to the murder of Mr. Floyd and subsequent BLM protests in Edmonton, Alberta? How did white participants describe their anti-racist work and awareness to what they acknowledge as unearned racial advantage following this event? So I'll take a moment and describe the June 2020 protest in Edmonton, Alberta, as I'm sure it was different around the world in various cities, states, provinces, and countries. Um, I think of this event as a uh, a particular as a critical event as explained by DOS or as a critical moment as explained by Bourdieu. Uh, and they create this moment has the opportunity to create substantial change in the perceptions of racism and whiteness for my white participants. So on June 5th, 2020, over 15,000 people, which is extremely significant for a, a small city, a small city, but a, a city like Edmonton, gathered for what was called an equity rally at the Alberta legislature. A number of community groups, including Black Lives Matter YEG or Edmonton, uh, planned the demonstration. And so a quick note on BLM in Canada. BLM began with a chapter in Toronto, Ontario in 2014. And this, uh, this group of community leaders collaborated through Facebook to create the first iteration of Black Lives Matter outside of um, the US. So BLM in Edmonton or BLM YEG began approximately two years later in 2016, but holds the same kind of tenants as BLM Toronto. So going back to this event, while this was one event for BL from BLM YEG and the supporting organizers, this event had significant impact on the lives of my Albertan participants who used this event, both the protest and the murder of, of Mr. Floyd, to reflect on the cultural and political facets of white identity, not just in the US, but also in the urban Canadian context. Media coverage of the event reported the crowd as diverse and including people of all ages. Speakers included community activists and leaders, as well as politicians, and all speakers referenced Mr. Floyd's murder and then connected this tragedy back to examples of police brutality in Edmonton. Another quick caveat, um, it seem, it's important to recognize that there is little um, systematic data collection that is published here in Canada with that is disaggregated according to racial identity. Therefore, stories and examples of egregious brutality to make it into the news were referenced instead of kind of larger statistics. So signs in the crowd also reference Mr. Floyd's uh, case specifically. For example, one attendee wrote, all mothers were summoned when George Floyd called out for his mama. 
Other signs mentioned other US victims of police violence, such as Breonna Taylor, and included general calls for defunding the police or for more accountability and oversight of the police. So in, the, in addition to the anti-Black racism in Minneapolis that was noted, I noticed a distinct theme of attendees acknowledging Indigenous experiences of police brutality and of Indigenous anti-Indigenous racism, and also of the later, lateral support for anti-Black equity work. The, there were also calls to address other forms of racial inequality at the protest. For example, some speakers held trans and LGBTQ2 plus um, flags, while other signs argued, for example, for the right to protest overall. What you see here, um, Kale Bill 1, um, on the bottom of the, uh, the, the left protester sign there, um, is referencing a political act called the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act that actually went through in our province of Alberta in June 2020, so at the exact same time as this protest was happening. This bill uh, allows law enforcement to arrest and fine anyone trying to shut down critical economic infrastructure, including railways and highways, and it um, also makes it easier for police to intervene on blockades rather than wait for court injunctions. And so this was referencing specifically the wet sewers um, uh, protesting. So what you see here on the left hand side is the missing and murdered Indigenous women red hand print as part of the black clenched or raised fist, symbolizing black power or black solidarity and or liberation. This intersectional frame speaks to some of the general findings from my work, namely that when asked to describe and compare racism and whiteness found in Canada versus the US, the majority of my participants describe Canadian racism as anti-Indigenous, while they label US racism as anti-Black racism. Importantly, a recent report in March of 2022 released by Statistics Canada does not support this belief um, as you know, anti-Black racism not being a feature of Canadian racism um, because this report found that Black Canadians followed by Jewish Canadians experienced the highest rate of hate and, um, hate and violence in Canada. And this was according to police reporting, which I know in and of itself is problematic. So how did my participants um, experience this event? So I'm gonna read a few quotes from individuals who unprompted spoke about the impact of the YEG protest on their lives. Now, again, I'm going to be speaking of more quotes than what you find here on the screen. I just wanted to give you a few to kind of um, pinpoint some of these experiences. So Chris is a 20 something white man living in Edmonton. He said, I would especially say that in the wake of things and the George, and, and the George Floyd's killing and the conversation around that, I was aware of anti-Black racism and police violence, but I think it really came to the forefront after this protest. Andrew, who's another white man in his 20s, confirms Chris's point that the conversation around anti-Black racism became a larger topic of conversation after among his white friends and family when he said, with the protests and stuff, there's been a strong swing against racism and there, will, and there are way more people talking about it rather than just the people who are individually affected by it now. Um, or you see Jake, who again is up here on the slide, a white man in his 30s who says, uh, sorry, Jake works in the trades, and he also found that he became more aware. He stated that, quote, the movement has made me more aware. I have more sympathy and empathy, and I detest racism. I now have the ability to see it more, more clearly. As we can see um, from these quotes, this protest and the event helped white folks solidify their hunches about the existence of anti-Black racism. In many conversations, white participants spoke about knowing more and having a clear idea about what kind of racism was happening. Jake, who we just heard from, um, goes on to state, I always knew it was there, but now I'm sure it's there. So I also heard from um, other individuals, for example, uh, Tara, who's a white woman in her 40s, who stated, quote, I think overall we, and he or she doesn't decide for whether this is white people or white Canadians, we are better um, and that white, uh, sorry, and that the George Floyd thing definitely has made people more aware and fighting for change. I do, I think we're getting better. So while she doesn't necessarily describe this as white Canadians, I think this is who she's actually speaking about in the context of the interview on white racial identity. So I wanted to quickly also point to Tara's description of this tragic event as the George Floyd thing. I'm still exploring this kind of referencing in my data, but I think this demonstrates a lack of comfort in discussing race and racism among my white participants, and it results in the decentering of a very real human life at the crux of this particular protest in 2020. So again, in the, in the title of this presentation, I use the term woke up call as a tongue in cheek reference to the point 
um, to point to the way that this event and the subsequent discussion of Mr. Floyd's murder here in Canada solidified some white Canadians' understandings of lived experiences of racism. This event uh, could be understood as convincing them to the, as to the veracity of anti-Black race, uh, racism and their experiences. This finding uh, supports what Okun uh, Dunavin, Jan Ince, and uh, Rojas, uh, their article, which um, just, sorry, titled BLM has successfully leveraged uh, protest events to engender lasting changes in the ways that Americans discuss racial inequity. So this would support their findings. And from my own work, I find that some white participants became more aware and more willing to be aware of the realities of anti-Black racism in Canada. So to be clear, um, I'm using this term wokeness. Uh, I'm not using the wokeness. I, I wanna avoid this idea of wokeness, but a woke up call. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the history of this term. So the history of woke terminology began as a watchword for black Americans to remain vigilant and aware of the systematized white violence against black people. Documentaries like Stay Woke, colon, the Black Lives Matter movement connected woke terminology to the BLM movement in addition to its, and to its use at movements. So woke discourse has been co-opted by individuals signaling both left and right political ideologies in Canada and in the US. And the left uses term to quote, identify as a staunch um, social justice advocate who's abreast of contemporary political cerns, concerns and on the right, where wokeness equals political correctness gone awry. And this is all from an article from Romano. So Romano contins, continues to say, you know, both sides, left and right, are concerned with the issues of performativity that undermine the sincerity of addressing equity issues. I wanted to also point out that historian Jamar Tisby argues that, quote, the metaphor of being woke implies that, in some sense, the individual was asleep to particular kinds of injustices and oppressions in the world, and now they've been awakened to it. But the outcome, Tisby argues, is that when appropriated, that this appropriated black word and ideas are stripped of meaning and potency as they are appropriated by mainstream uh, spaces. This point was brought home in my own research by one participant, Todd, who's a white male pastor in his 50s, who works out um, with a Christian congregation. So Todd spoke about the difficulties in engaging with evangelical congregations in discussions around Black Lives Matter. He argues that in his networks, wherever BLM is brought up in conversation, the discussion quickly devolves into political or religious condemnation. In one of our interviews, he actually sent me um, a PDF of the evangelical response, the Canadian evangelical response to BLM and how they couldn't support such a matter for various reasons, which, um, you know, were supported with uh, their understandings of political and religious ideas. I also spoke to another Christian pastor, Paul, who's in his early 60s, who stated that, quote, he didn't know if he really agreed with Black Lives Matter, but he felt like he couldn't say anything because quote, then I would get, uh, I would have somebody jump down my throat or something like this, which I've heard in many, many other interviews, white folks feeling as though they cannot participate or have an opinion, often an dissenting opinion on Black Lives Matter, because then they would be, um, you know, jump, pe people have jumping down their throats in response. Uh, this has to do, of course, with lots of uh, discussions and ideas around freedom of speech, which are coupled and wrapped within these larger ideas around privilege, etc. So like Paul, not all, my, all of my participants were similarly struck or convinced by about the realities of anti-Black racism in Canada or the US. Um, Shabazz, please step in if, I, if you ever can't hear me or um, could you also uh, you know, let me know how I'm doing in terms of timing? Um, I'll also be able to, oh, thanks, Michelle. Um, uh, just let me know how I'm doing for that. Okay, so here's an example, uh, a few examples for exa uh, of folks who were not convinced um, and again, the purpose of BLM, I just want to state clearly, is not to convince white folks or otherwise. This is not, as we've, as we've heard from previous uh, conversations, this is, again, what I'm talking about with reference to how my um, un, unpro unprovoked or un, unprompted my respondents use this event as a, as a means to situate themselves. So Leon, who's a late 30s white male mechanic, took issue with the tone of, BL of the BLM movement. Um, Leon spoke of the issue of Black Lives Matter Toronto and protesting the Pride Parade in Toronto as a means to call attention to the inclusion of the police in the Pride event um, and its inherent hypocrisy. 
This example of tone policing is something activists have long problematized, of course, among so-called allies. And of course, we can reference uh, many scholars work, many scholars and activists works on this. I find uh, Dr. Sarah Ahmed's work uh, very um, eye-opening and important here. Um, I also wanted to call to the nature of an Edmontonian referencing an event that happened in Toronto. So this kind of cross-national understanding of placement with regard to uh, BLM protests across the, across the nation in Canada. Or Marion, who is a white woman in her 40s and works in the oil and gas industry. And she stated, you see the huge Black Lives Matter and stuff, like, but then you kind of wonder too, are people just doing this for show or how deep is their dedication? And to contextualize these thoughts further, she goes on to state, quote, in the grand scheme of things, I think there's less racism overall even just compared to previous generations. So what you see here is the questioning of the veracity of racism and the profiling at the hands of the police and the anti-Black racism. And, and this was also a theme as you can see here in both Darcy and Dylan's uh, quotes, which I won't read off. So these quotes help me understand the difference and complexity of white responses to movements calling for racial equity. There are many respondents who associated BLM with an alt left agenda as the BLM campaign has been politicized instead of being recognized as its equity seeking goal. And I think we saw that in Andre's um, discussion earlier this morning. Um, as well as uh, Shabazz's. The coverage of various BLM protests in the media and subsequent politicization of these events was an important factor for how some of my participants related to the event. In Dylan's, in Dylan's quote, this hysteria was described as being part of this alt-right, alt-left agenda, uh, which was then described as being situated solely around identity politics. So I will continue to unpack these ideas, especially throughout this conference, but for the sake of timing, I'd like to move on to my second question that I'd like to address in this paper today. Um, and that is um, another side of this wake up call lands at the intersection of anti-racism work and whiteness. And so it's not just a matter of, I think in the previous question, I was trying to reflect on how folks were you know, reflecting in, in response to the event that happened in um, the, the particular, you know, 15,000 strong protests that happened at Edmonton. Um, but now I'm looking at what kind of action came out of this. Um, and so uh, while this tragic event brought my white participants to a moment of clarity about everyday experiences of racism, I will now explore the kind of action resulting from this awareness. So for example, Brent, who works uh, for a community serving organization in Edmonton stated, quote, I was not aware that the way I deal with work uh, with the world was not the same as others. What with the Black Lives Matter, I know now that while my experiences with the cops are fine, it's not necessarily a bad experience for everyone. This demonstrates a self-reflection and an awareness for situated experience and white privilege. Bill, um, who's not uh, covered here, says, I have a friend who was all about BLM for three weeks, and now it's all back to kittens and puppies. And, okay. Um, now it's all back to kittens and puppies. And so what I wanted to point out with this quote is that, you know, Bill was now seeing this as, you know, the optics of performative and optical allyship and what goes on beyond that. Um, this can also, of course, be used as a distancing measure to say that, that you know, Bill is better than others. Um, and this is, again, something I'm continuing to unpack with my research. Stacy, who you can see quoted here on the slide, says uh, uh, she's a 20 something woman. Uh, she says BLM is important because it's helped me pay attention to the racism against Indigenous people here in Canada. Racism for Black Americans is worse. Um, racism for Black Americans is worse um, in the US, but here in Canada, it's against Indigenous people. Um, I think I forgot a few words on here, sorry, um, but she's referencing the US model here. Um, What's important about this is this idea that Black Lives Matter and, and the campaign work that's been done there has helped Canadians, again, identify that there are certain uniquely contextual uh, equity uh, campaigns that they'd like to be a part of, not necessarily the Black Lives Matter movement. And again, I just wanted to point out what I had mentioned earlier is that Black Canadians have the highest proportion of hate crime um, experience, the highest proportion of hate crime in Canada. So there is a certain framing of Canadians as I, I by and large find this that Canadians tend to identify anti-Indigenous racism as the most pertinent or important uh, equity campaign to, to follow up with. And this is not a bad thing to do, um, but it, it just shows the privileging of one equity campaign over other that wasn't Black Lives Matter, um, despite their involvement with Black Lives Matter. Um, okay, 
I wanted to continue that, you know, folks thought that they were willing to, to do things that they saw as sacrificing. So for example, uh, Robert said, uh, I posted online about BLM and lost friends. Uh, this is Robert's a, a white male in his twenties. And then you've got somebody like Connor who says, uh, now Connor is a 20 year old man who lives in a small town just outside Edmonton. And he agreed to participate in this interview as, after one of the pastors that I spoke about earlier encouraged him to do so. And he stated, um, you know, it just feels like a lot when I'm, I was out there as a new liberal, I was all gung ho about all these ideas to go for it, just go for it. Now I'm just worn out kind of George Floyd happened. And it was cool because I actually sat back for the most part and watched everybody else kind of fight. And I was trying to fight for a long time. Seeing the conversation was a huge relief. But in this area in Alberta, I'm gassed. And so there's a lot to unpack in, in that, uh, you know, again, you see this kind of distancing as, you know, Connor self identifies as somebody who um, is further along in his anti racism journey, and I'm not here to question that, um, but to bring up this idea that he's better than others has been associated with white liberal racism, um, this idea that, you know, we're not as bad or this kind of bad apple theory about who and what is a bad who 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 and what enacts racism. Um, this, of course, allows uh, white folks to sidestep accountability or to see the racism that is alive and well and the whiteness that is alive and well within white folks, um, you know, living as majority community members in Canada. Um, Connor's discussion also brings up what uh, Drs. D'Angelo and Sensoy, five minutes, thank you, Shabazz, um, idea of racial stamina, which is defined as the quote, capacity to endure racial stress when presented with the fact that many white people are complicit to systemic racism. So again, this kind of sidestepping of complicity um, I think it's it's really, this is my concluding slide, so I'm glad that I am hopefully within the time here. Um, but there are a few things that I wanted to kind of circle back to. So those were my, those are just some of the um, quotes that I wanted to pull for today to try to answer these questions as to how this event in particular um, really featured in my uh, participants' work. I wanted to mention that, you know, I've been doing this work since 2019 and over the years, it's um, collecting, you know, I, I collected, I, I did a, a first, you know, large chunk of interviews around 50, um, or sorry, around 45 uh, in, 29, in 2020, and then about 10 in 2021, and I'm doing about 10 in 2022. And there's different events that kind of really feature in each in each year. So in, in the 2020 interviews, you know, the YEG protest was really forefront in how people situated their white identity and their white racial advantage and, and other kind of things like this. So I think it's important um, to think about this, of, you know, how the situational analysis of this event. And so in this way, um, I wanted to kind of unpack using uh, uh, Mosca's uh, understanding of events. And he kind of compares organizational theory and anthropology to understand the importance of um, events as a means to, um, unpack, uh, you know, what do events give us as, as researchers and as, as individuals involved and interested in creating more anti-racist outcomes. And so events like the Yeg protest uh, helped us understand, you know, give us an insight or a window into society. They also help us understand how um, we can understand this event as an agentic, to, agentic tool, and that is to study singular events, to understand their, you know, bigger structures in society. An event like that can also help us understand this kind of global form. So to understand how this event compares to other similar local, national, and international events. They're also a space of practice. You know, we saw this in a lot of the, uh, the quotes there where participation in this event and whatever was done results in the, a new ordering of ideas or people or things and how this might impact future practice. And finally, in this process, and that's, you know, this idea that, you know, it's one event to have happened that kind of comes back time and again and how it changes in terms of how people see themselves and see others within larger societies. So this kind of situated analysis that happens on behalf of the participants um, over time. So I think in all that this BLM YAG uh, protest was a, a catalyst for some to understand and build self-awareness about their lived experience, but of course not for everyone. So I just also wanted to, again, thank the organizers, uh, to Shabazz, um, to Eva, who will be presenting next um, in this uh, particular um, session. And so uh, thanks very much. And I look forward to your questions. And my you can find my email here. Mm -hmm.